Hi, this is Frank Taylor in Floyd County, and I'm in my backyard on a decidedly rainy day. The school year is ending, um, and tomorrow is my last day of doing five videos a week. I'm going to switch and do two videos a week for my extended summer outreach. If you go to back to one of my first episodes of Nature in Your Backyard, way back, probably 50 episodes ago, I showed you how to make a rain gauge at home. And I was using my rain gauge, but it filled up. I didn't make my rain gauge tall enough. I used a four inch tall uh, glass jar. I put my ruler in. I got four inches of rain here and I got more except it overflowed. So I'm going to either have to remember to empty my rain gauge each day and write down how much rain I got, or I need a bigger rain gauge. I need to get a taller jar to use for my rain gauge. So this week I really wanted to emphasize uh, plants that you can find in your lawn that are blooming right now. And I got two more plants that are blooming right now. This is the third week of May, right before uh, is it Memorial Day? We've seen so many plants in a lawn already. Let me try to remember. We saw fleabane. We saw sour grass. We talked about dandelion, how that was a plant that was introduced to America and brought here by the settlers for medicinal and food uses. We saw gill over the ground. We saw ground ivy, a purple dead nettle, and I'm sure a lot of other ones. So today we're going to finish out the dozen or so species that you can see uh, growing in your, your grass uh, right now. And I'm going to go over and grab a couple. But since it's raining out here and my camera's, I don't want my camera to get much wetter, um, I'm going to take them and go inside and we'll look at them up close. Right here in your backyard, you never know what you're going to find. And here's to make this invasive. It's like top. Dogwoods are flowering. And I just took a couple swipes. Terrestrial environment. Uh, produce seed pollen. And it's. So here we are inside with my kitchen laboratory. And first we're going to talk about white clover. White clover just might be the plant in your lawn that you recognize best. And it is easily recognizable by its distinctly round and uh, three leaflets uh, leaf. And you can see that I wasn't very lucky today because if I was lucky, I would have found one of these leaves with four leaves on it. So this is often known as a four leaf clover, um, except right now all I have is three leaves, but this is always a favorite to look for. This plant does really great in lawns. And if you look at it, you know, one of the reasons why is look how tall most of the plant is. Most of the plant is two inches tall. How tall do you mow a lawn? Most lawns are mowed at around three or three and a half inches. So most of this plant stays underneath your lawnmower parts. And so it thrives in lawns. And not only does it thrive, it kind of depends on you mowing that grass. Because if the grass around it gets too tall, it won't be able to grow. And uh, whether it, how many seeds it produces is going to depend on how often you mow your grass. Because you can see the flower heads are much taller. So if you mow your grass every three or four days and never gets above two inches, your grass will probably uh, not have clover growing it. But if you mow your grass every week or every two weeks or so, you're likely to have clover because not only can it grow, but it can flower and produce seeds. There's another clover that looks a lot like this one with the leaves like this, and it's called red clover. And one of the big differences is, of course, that it has red flowers but it also grows taller. So red clover usually is not going to grow in your lawn because it's, it's a plant that's too tall and you'll just mow it down. And you will find red clover in the edges of roadsides and the edges of your yard, maybe against a fence where you're not mowing very tightly. So red clover can thrive there. But you won't see white clover where you got red clover. 
Why is that? Because white clover can't compete with the, the tall, tall weeds that are around it. So white clover actually thrives um, in your lawn environment. Another reason it does so well in your lawn is because it reproduces by a stolen. So when I first pulled this up out of the grass, I thought I was pulling up one flower. And then the more I pulled, the more connected it was. And so rather than this just being one plant, this is all part of a single plant. So it can reproduce not just by the seeds produced by a flower, but it can also reproduce by the stolen that goes underneath the ground. So even if you mow it so frequently the flowers aren't produced, it can still survive here. There's so many interesting things about this plant. This plant also has some little nodules on the roots. And you see those little nodules there on the roots? There's one right there. There's one over here, and I can see two or three or four of them pretty well. So when you're out in your yard and you see some clover, pull it up and see if you can see these little nodules right here. Well, these little nodules are part of the plant, but inside is bacteria. Usually we think of bacteria as being bad, but there is a special relationship between clover and the bacteria in these nodules. When two animals or two plants or two organisms live close together, it's called symbiosis. And when they both benefit from the relationship, we call this symbiosis, a particular kind of symbiosis, we call it mutualism. And we call it mutualism because they both mutually benefit. The bacteria that live in this root have a safe place to live. It's kind of environmentally controlled. They get water and probably some other nutrients and stuff. And the uh, bacteria that live in here, in turn, take nitrogen from the air and change it into a form that plants can use. So clover actually enriches the soil. So in this symbiotic relationship, this relationship we call mutualism because it's mutually beneficial to both. There is a bacteria living with the plant. So here we have a plant, we have a bacteria, and they're living together in here. The bacteria are basically, well, we could call them good bacteria. You hear a lot about bad bacteria, but these are actually good bacteria and helpful bacteria. And they help the plant grow and they enrich the soil around it. So, because of these nitrogen-fixing bacteria in here, farmers like to plant this plant um, to enrich the soil of their farms. So maybe one year you plant corn in a field, and then you take all the corn out, and along with the corn goes all the nutrients that are in the soil. The next year you could plant clover in that field, and the clover will put nitrogen, which is a plant fertilizer, which is a, an essential nutrient for plants to grow, and clovers will put that back into the soil again. Farmers also plant this because it's a great forage crop. It's great food for sheep and horses and donkeys and cows. It's really ver a very, very nutritious plant and obviously nitrogen rich as well. This is a clover flower and I want to talk about the flower in particular right now. If you notice very, very carefully, can you see that this flower is actually made up of a lot of individual flowers that form this entire flower head? And there's an interesting strategy by this plant is that it won't produce all its flowers at one time. Let's take a look at, at this, this one right here. You can see that in the middle of this flower are buds that haven't opened yet. These buds are going to open soon. On the outside, the buds are open. So the plant has buds open to be fertilized by bees that will come from flower to flower. And tomorrow it will have more flowers again. Now, I'm pretty sure the way it's rained in the last three days, none of these flowers got pollinated. 
So on the next sunny day, there's going to be another set of flowers that can be pollinated. So this is a way that the plant ensures that even if the weather goes bad at a certain time, it's going to uh, have flowers appearing over days and days and maximize its chance of producing uh, pollinated flowers, fertilized flowers that will produce seeds. So another thing I want you to do when you go outside and look at these flowers is pick one up and look in the middle and see if you can see the buds that haven't opened. Look very carefully and if you have a magnifying glass you can see how eat, there's those individual flowers that are all the way open. But do you see the flowers that are upside down? The flowers that are upside down and pointing down to the ground have been pollinated and they are uh, have fertilized uh, seeds in them and the seeds will soon dry and drop out of the bottom of the plant. Here's another flower. Can you see all the three stages? There in the middle are the buds. There on the outside are the open flowers. And pointing down, there's the flowers that have been fertilized They've been pollinated, and soon they're going to turn to seed, and those seeds will drop out to the ground. So this was white clover with its white flowers that are really important for honey production. It's not a tall plant. As we can see on our ruler, it's about two inches or three inches tall. It reproduces by a stolen underground along with seeds from the flowers. We talked about how the flowers have, have three different levels or parts to them. They have the flower buds, the flowers that are open, and the flowers that are turning upside down. In these flowers, clover produces lots and lots of flowers. And with these flowers, there's lots and lots of nectar. And these are great for honeybees. So clover has so many important uses for farming as a, a forage crop for animals. It's important in farming to because it enriches the soil with nitrogen, called a process called nitrogen fixation, where nitrogen from the air is converted by bacteria in the nodules of this plant into a useful form. And it's also great for honeybees. And uh, a lot of people that um, are beekeepers will sell white clover honey because they know that most of the honey that came from that particular hive came from the clover when it was blooming in the fields close by. So next to my white clover today, I've found hop clover, one of the hop clovers. And there's several different species and they're characterized by obviously a yellow flower and they have clover-like leaves as well and let me see if i can separate one out and look at that clover leaf close so here i've put the uh, yellow clovers leaves here next to the white clover so if you see this without the flower you might still be able to identify it white clover leaves are, are are pretty big and each of the three leaflets are about the size of my index finger fingernail these ones are a little bit smaller and are not quite as round and the other thing to notice here is notice that the middle leaf has a little stalk on it and that's how you can identify the, the actual type of this yellow clover because there's several of these species of yellow clovers also called hop clovers so this particular species and i have to consult my newcomb's field guide that says that um, the species with the little stalk on the middle leaf is called low hop clover low hop clover so today we saw white clover and low hop clover so you can also see, you can get pretty sophisticated identifying some of these plants. I think it's okay to call this one a yellow hop clover, but if you want to get down to business, you can get a field guide like this one um, that I like to use. This is called Newcomb's Guide, uh, Newcomb's Wildflower Guide. And it's my favorite one to use to identify a lot of different plants. So thanks for watching another episode of Nature in Your Backyard on this uh, rainy day. And if it stops raining, remember I want you to go outside and see what you can find. And look for all the different things in your lawn. How many different plants can you find in a lawn? 
that's near your house or your neighborhood or in a local park. And you can, you know, in lawns, it's, they're going to get mowed over. You can bring a piece of paper. And I've had my students in my classes lay out one leaf from all the different plants they can find. And a lot of these you should be able to uh, identify now. Remember, I want you to go outside and find things. I don't want you to just watch my videos. I want you to experience the outdoors and nature and look for stuff because you never know what you're going to find. And then when you find it, if you can identify it or get help identifying it, that opens the door to finding out more about that particular plant species. Always fact check me too. I'm doing this live. I get excited. Sometimes I mix up some things. Always check and see if you know, my facts are right and also to find out more about it. And there's a lot of, there's so much out there that you can learn about. So thanks for watching Nature in My Backyard. Next week, I got some other great episodes to show you. This week, I wanted to cover a lot of things that I know you can find in your lawn. And uh, in the coming weeks, I got box turtles and salamanders and stoneflies and so many different kinds of organisms. So see you soon. Thanks for watching Nature in Your Backyard.